All right, so we're, I think we're we're in business. Sorry about the the delay. Um, so for today, our plan is to um, wrap up some of these programming language um, tooling, uh, you know, representation, interpretation, and tooling topics, and. Um, then we will try to end around 6 so we can actually get over to the ACM presentation, which is on uh, open, source, uh, open source development. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, very briefly, last time we were looking at these phases of the tool chain. So again, the, um, the things that are in italics are activities and the non-italic things are artifacts, okay, at the different points. All right, so, um, and the assumption is we start with with a source code stored in a file, so it's basically an, an externalized string stored in a file, and then the uh, source code undergoes these various phases with these various intermediate artifacts um, being shown here. And in our project 3A, we're basically skipping lexical and syntax analysis and we're starting straight with the abstract syntax tree. So that requires kind of dealing with, um, you know, the fact that we're writing, uh, we're, we're, we're building Scala objects representing these trees. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit of a barrier there. And we'll talk about these, um, these um, earlier stages called the front end shortly. And then what we're doing is essentially just directly interpreting the abstract syntax tree. So that's what your evaluator does, right? So it takes the abstract syntax tree, and the situation we have in project 3A is our result values are also expressions. So in other words, we essentially reduce the initial abstract syntax tree that represents our program to another program um, of the same type, but using only certain branches, right? So using only either constant branch or the fun branch. And then in project 3B, we're going to add also the cell branch to represent some, some values other than numbers, right? So some kind of general structuring construct from which we can build arbitrary linear or nonlinear data structures, okay? But the key is we're doing this direct interpretation, whereas normally with a real compiler, you know, if you look at the, you know, maybe the, one of the most widely used compiler tool chains, uh, the, the GNU CC compiler suite, right? GCC and friends, we need G++, uh, GNU ADA, uh, various other uh, language front end, okay. So, you know, it really goes through these phases and, and maybe more even, you know, so there's a um, kind of intermediate code representation even that is, um, let's say, the result of transforming a language-specific abstract syntax tree to a language-independent uh, intermediate representation, and then the back end generates um, the machine code from that. So native machine code that runs, as, as you could say, on the bare metal, meaning unmanaged code not running in a virtual machine, you know, not like, let's say, um, you know, .NET or, or JVM bytecode. That's managed code, right, where there's the hardware, bare metal layer, 
And on top of that, a virtual machine layer, that means you have managed code. Okay. And um, there are these various pieces here, so optimization, you know, simple stuff such as common sub-expression elimination or more complex stuff as we discussed, you know, tail recursion elimination where uh, the, the tail call, or more generally tail call elimination, not just tail recursion, okay? So any tail call you can in principle uh, optimize away so that you're, you're basically just um, replacing the current invocation of, of the current method by the one for the method that you're calling, and you don't really have to come back to the caller if you just did a tail call. You know, so that's the idea. You know, just like we discussed when we looked at tail recursion, so that can be generalized to tail calls. So those are optimizations. And then code generation deals with things like allocating variables to actual hardware registers and stuff like that. So code generation is target specific. Now, the target could be a virtual machine, right? So in that case, the target would be, let's say, the JVM. But the target, uh, you know, so that's the case when you're looking at, the, at Java C or Scala C those compilers, but for, let's say, a C compiler or C++ compiler or so, um, or the Go language, the languages that are actually compiled to native code, the target is the actual hardware. You know, so the, the code generation phase of the compiler knows um, the details of the hardware and is specific to that. And there used to be much more diversity, uh, a much more diverse hardware landscape, maybe up to, I guess, 15 years ago, roughly, I'm trying to recall. But let's say when I started here, uh, I had a Sunwork station, and that had a Spark um, processor, which was a so-called RISC, re re Reduced Instruction Set Computer, or Reduced Instruction Set Chip. Um, and there were, of course, uh, tools that were targeting that hardware. But again, you have the modularity in the sense that everything up to code generation was target independent, and then the code generation was target specific. You know, that's how these things would be architected. And um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, so you have these Motorola processors also, you know, the um, uh, 68,000 um, used by, by the Apple, or the, you know, the more recent ones, I guess, called the G3 and the G4 that were used in the PowerBooks before Mac switched to Intel hardware, and now it's pretty much all uh, some kind of x86-based type of chip, right, with multiple cores and things like that, but it's kind of a, um, uh, you know, a consolidation where <coughs> all the major computer vendors ultimately standardized on some type of Intel-based hardware, Intel or AMD, um, which have a lot of stuff in common also. So, um, great. So, yeah, that's the basic tool chain architecture and just what you know what's the difference between um, direct interpretation and code generation you could think about it like this you could think of the code generator or all of the back end um, steps meaning from optimization on down, you could say, well, those are, um, in a way, um, methods or, or behaviors that evaluate, in some way, your um, 
your internal representation, your abstract representation of the program. And in the case of code generation, the result is the generated code. Okay. Um, so, for example, in Project 2B, there was um, one behavior where a tree of shapes was scaled. Okay. So you think about that as being a little bit similar to, let's say, a transformation where you're um, you're somehow you know you're changing the the code, um, but the basic structure stays similar. Um, you know, so that's one thing. Um, whereas with code generation, so you you start with the uh, tree representation of the program, the abstract syntax tree, or or more abstract, uh, lower level internal uh, tree representation, and then the behavior produces a, a result from that, and that result in in this case happens to be the executable code, right? Which in a way is the result of interpreting the internal representation of the program in a certain way, as opposed to the direct interpretation, which is also a behavior that interprets the same uh, internal representation of your program, but it produces the answer that the program is ultimately supposed to produce, right? Like in our case, in Project 3A, we get, for example, a number as an answer, okay? So at some level of abstraction, that's what I'm trying to say, um, the code generator is an interpreter, but it doesn't produce the final answer. It just produces some other artifact, okay, as a result of interpreting the internal representation of the program. It produces another representation, which is the generated code, and um, or the or the yeah machine code or byte code. Does that make sense? So the type of course where you would study um, these techniques and the underlying concepts in more detail would be a full-fledged compiler course. So here we're just getting a little bit of a flavor of these kinds of things. Um, because we have a compiler course in the course catalog, and um, we need to bring it back into the actual course schedule, but we haven't done that yet, you know, but um, we're hoping to do that sometime soon. Um, so that's where this would be studied in detail. So now, let's look at least a little bit at some of the underlying foundations as they are most relevant to um, the study of programming languages. And um, one important topic is what's called language semantics. And semantics means the meaning of something, okay? And the meaning is something that is expressed as a specification of your language, typically. So let's say you want to know what exactly a program written in source code form means. You want to know that. Where do you go? Well, for example, for language X, you pull out you know, either you pull it up online or you pull it out of your shelf, your bookshelf, the language specification, right? So you would expect there to be a document where the language is specified. How does that relate to, say, the code, the, the compiler or the interpreter? How do, how do those relate to each other? Well, you would expect the compiler or interpreter to to um, be true to this language specification, meaning whatever the interpreter does, it better be consistent with 
what the language specification says. Okay, so historically, um, some languages kind of emerged experimentally, and there might not have been a formal specification for that language, and the the interpreter or compiler was there. You know, so it could it could have arisen in either order. So let's say someone was experimenting with with uh, the interpreter and got it to a point where it behaved like it made sense to them, and then you could reverse engineer the language specification based on that. I mean, so that that can happen, okay? But um, with languages that place more of an emphasis on foundational soundness, meaning on being um, being defined clearly in in ways that make sense, um, you would usually expect there to be a formal language definition, a language specification document, um, and that would be kind of the the contract for people working on the tools, on the compilers, interpreters, other related tools. Okay. And the language specification would uh, typically be expressed in, in terms of the semantics. And we distinguish between um, dynamic semantics, which has been our focus. So we have, relating this to our project, right, so we have um, basically, you know, the abstract syntax, which just says how are programs represented, right? And then we immediately proceeded to say, what do programs mean? These are our possible result values up there, right? The types, numbers, and functions. And then everything else says, what does a program mean? And it's defined recursively, okay? So this is our, so to speak, this in conjunction with the embedded arithmetic expressions that we have, this is our language definition, so to speak, okay, or language specification. Now, this is entirely dynamic. We don't do anything before, you know, any kinds of checks before trying to interpret, meaning run the program. Right, so we're focusing entirely on the dynamic meaning of our little programs, and that's what your evaluator implements. But you could also do other things. Um, for example, before attempting to interpret a program, you could say, well, let's take a look at it first and see if there are any obvious errors before we try to run it. Okay. So, you know, I try to give, I usually give this, this silly example, and there's also an April Fool's joke, which is appropriate because we just started April recently. So, um, the example I give sometimes is, you know, let's say if you have a program in a dynamic language um, and this program controls, let's say, um, key functions of, of your airplane. So then you take off, you know, and then you get a runtime type error. So that could be a problem, right? You know, <laughs> if you're lucky, um, the part that allows you to do the emergency eject you know, assuming it's a small plane, right, with, with that feature, you know, if you're lucky, then that is done in some kind of fail-safe way. Um, whereas if, the, you know, the statically typed approach is more like, well, you're not allowed to take off un unless it, it um, passes certain checks. Okay. Now, in fairness, you know, again, it's this trade-off, and if you, if you listen to the 
Um, this is an episode I should actually encourage everybody to listen to. So there's a software engineering radio episode, which is an interview with Uncle Bob, you know, Bob Martin. Um, and he is describing these things a little bit. So, in fact, um, some of that is discussed in the presentation uh, that we looked at partially. Okay. So, in fairness, you could say, well, if you do a lot of unit testing before you take off, you know, let's say you don't do static type checking, and you do a lot of unit testing very exhaustively. And if it passes your exhaustive uh, test suite, then you're reasonably, you know, very confident that things will be okay once you're airborne. So, you know, I, I'm going to be fair and say that that's typically what people do when they when they work with dynamically typed languages. Okay, and uh, I think in practice it's good to do both. Okay. Um, but yeah, so coming back to the conceptual part here, so just to kind of make sense of the terminology here, so um, you have been working with the dynamic semantics of the simply typed lambda calculus. It really doesn't have much in terms of static semantics. But you've also been working with statically typed languages such as uh, Java, Scala, C Sharp, maybe, et cetera, that have um, very um, detailed static semantics. So the static semantics is something that you look at as you're analyzing the source of the program without or before executing it. So, for example, do the different types of things you're plugging together actually fit together. So in a statically typed language, all of that is um, checked at compile time. Okay. Other things could be flow analysis. You've probably seen flow analysis um, when defining a variable in, let's say, Java, and then trying to use it without initializing it. So that's not a type checking thing, that's a flow analysis um, to check whether the variable that you're using has been either assigned a value or, or given an initial value, right? Um, so, but those are things that are done uh, and can be done at compile time. And typically in statically typed languages, these things are done at, at compile time, okay. Um, so let me try to pull up this April Fool's joke here for Haskell. Um, yeah, so there's a paper on the history of Haskell. And um, let's see if this is loading. So it's it's not loading now, but um, let's see. Let's do a search here. I think this is the one. Okay. So here, so there's a story there, okay, at York. Uh, he wrote a Haskell program to control a hoist. And then there was some experiment that went wrong. Okay, and that's, that's actually 21 years ago, okay. And then this one here, so recently Haskell was used in an experiment at Yale in the medical school. It was used to replace a C program that controlled a heart-lung machine. In the six months that it was in operation, the hospital estimates that probably a dozen lives were saved because the program was far more robust than the C program, <laughs> which often crashed and killed the patients. So, so I, I'm on this mailing list, you know, so when I got this, well, it's got to be a joke, you know. I mean, it's, 
plausible, but you know, given the date, it's got to be a joke. Uh, there was some kind of, I guess, discussion that followed this. Anyway, so um, okay, this is loaded now. Uh, that's cool. And I mean, it's it's uh, cited in there somewhere in, in this history paper. Anyway, um, but so the thing is. In this presentation, we're discussing this a little bit, and um, we got, I think, up to here, and this is where we're going to spend a little, oh yeah, okay, the link is, so, let's see, um, first let's wrap up the dynamic semantics part, and, um, the dynamic semantics refers to defining the dynamic or runtime meaning of a program, okay? And there is a pretty decent wiki page on this here. And there's a little problem with the link. Okay, so here, it's easy to fix. All right, and these are the main types of semantics used widely. So denotational means you look at a program or, or an expression and you give the meaning mathematically uh, in terms of, for example, uh, mathematical sets or things like that. You know, you say, well, um, you know, the, you basically state the meaning as some kind of uh, expression uh, in terms of mathematical objects. So the, a conceptual meaning. So this is not, you know, so this makes sense mathematically, okay? Uh, it's well defined, but this is the denotational semantics uh, isn't necessarily or not usually a program that will perform the function of an interpreter, okay? Whereas operational semantics is by describing what each thing means and typically, um, let's say, giving steps that would allow you to transform uh, a program until it can no longer be transformed further. And it would say, well, whatever you get at that point, that's the meaning of that program. You know, but it would give you the sequence of steps. And that's exactly what our evaluator does, right? Our evaluator says, well, for each branch of, con for each kind of construct we can have in our language, um, if that construct represents, or if, that's a, if that construct is of a certain kind, that is the result. Else, do certain things, let's say recursively evaluate some subtrees, combine these things in certain ways, and then that's your result or that's one step, and then continue doing this recursively until what, what you get is uh, a possible result, all right? So that's what we have here, right? So um, that's one, t one style of operational semantics. The uh, syntactic transformations at the abstract syntax tree level of uh, expressions or phrases in the language itself, okay? When you have an imperative language, it's often done more in, um, in an abstract machine style. And let me show you that, if I can find it. Uh, let's see. Um. 
Okay. So archived. Let's see if this still works. Yeah, that clone site is really slow, but okay, it's coming up eventually, so that's good. Uh, let's go here. Yeah, okay, good. Thank goodness, okay. Oh, no, here it's coming up, okay. Alright, so... This is for a simple imperative language. So I'm showing you this so you get a little bit of a counterpart to the lambda calculus as being a very simple functional language, a pure functional language. And here we're looking at um, a very simple imperative language which has the same computational power, um, and I wish this were loading a little faster. Here it is. Okay. And so this stuff looks familiar, right? The arithmetic expressions are, are the same. But then the statements we have, so instead of having ways to create functions and applying the functions. Here we can have, we can assign um, the result of an expression to a variable. We can sequentially compose statements and we have a while loop. So with this we can also do very similar stuff and there are some operational semantics for this here. but. You know, you could basically write any kind of program with these simple statements, but more complex programs would not be well structured. They would be just kind of monolithic and um, hard to maintain, hard to understand, hard to maintain. But in terms of the computational power, you know, can it um, compute the same kinds of results? Yes. Okay. And, you know, how do you define that kind of, uh, how do you define the meaning of, of uh, programs written using these statements? You know, you might say, oh, it's obvious. I mean, but really it isn't quite obvious. Or you could also say, well, um, if it's obvious, you know, then how do you, um, how do you implement an interpreter for programs in this language? Okay, so again, the, the uh, techniques would be basically the same, right? You would represent programs like this as, uh, as trees, you know, you could have this uh, front end where you would do lexical uh, analysis and you would parse the stuff and you would then end up with a tree. And um, then you would have to say, well, how do, you, how do I give meaning to that tree? And Basically, here is a way to formalize this. Um, this is just for formalizing arithmetic expressions with embedded variables. So what this means, okay, we, we assume we have mutable memory here. The M is for the mutable memory, okay. And to evaluate um, a constant in the context of this mutable memory, What's the value of the constant? It's just a constant itself, right? That's what this means. So it means this expression in the context of this memory, and then the down arrow means evaluate to, um, and then it says, okay, that's, that's the result, right? So the constant, to know what the value of the constant is, we don't need to look at the memory, okay? 
What about for the variable? So if, and you have to read these things right to left, basically. So if we, we want to evaluate the variable x in the context of this mutable memory, what we have to do is basically look up x. You know, so x is a variable, so look up x, and then we get some kind of um, memory location, and we want to look inside that memory location, and that's what the result of that is. Does that make sense so far? I mean, it's, it's very straightforward. The notation is a little unusual, but but that's because it's um, you know a formal set of evaluation rules, and we were dealing just with an informal, um, let's say, well, we were we were describing our evaluation rules more informally, and we formalized them in, uh, in the form of our implementation, right, where it had to be formal because it's a program that has to follow proper rules. And then this is for evaluating an addition, and this should look very, you know, this should remind you of what you did or what you saw in the expert example, which you incorporated into your project 3A. So what this says, again, read it right to left and bottom to top. So start here. To evaluate E1 plus E2 in the context of this memory, um, we have to perform addition. Yeah, this, is, this is syntax, right? So there's a plus tree here, a plus node. And this one is actually taking these values and mathematically adding them numerically, right? So if E1 evaluates to R1 and E2 evaluates to R2, then E1 plus E2 syntactically evaluates to the sum of R1 and R2, right? So it's basically, it boils down to what we already saw, except that we were expressing it as um, a recursive function, but it's the same idea. What is also different between our lambda calculus and this little imperative language here? What is one key difference? What does this little, la uh, what does the um, semantics of this language use that we are not using in in our lambda calculus. Pardon? Oh, no, no. I mean, this is just doing several things, you know, as part of your recursive um, evaluation, right? And then you're combining them. It's a bigger structural thing. Yeah. Is a method call on D? That? Well, that's kind of a detail, but I think this will lead you to the answer. Three. That's right. We're here. We have a, 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 a amorphous big thing that's our memory, and it's a mutable, mutable memory, right? So mutable global memory. And in the lambda calculus, we don't have that, right? Why not? Well, because the only way values ultimately get assigned to variables, right, is um, through function application, right? So you have a lambda that says, okay, here's a slot, kind of a memory slot that, that will be available in this subtree as a symbol. So lambda x, e, so in E, X is available as a symbol. So you can refer to that X within that E, and you're assuming that by the time you, you or before the, the time you actually get to the X, it would have been substituted because you're applying this function to some, some other expression, right? So there would be that expression, and you would hope that you actually never find a free variable, right? That's what our evaluator assumes. But it, uses, it simply uses a, this very different mechanism to um, bind variables 
to things that ultimately will not have variables in them. Uh, whereas here, we have, the, there's this other construct coming up. Okay. So time to make this a little smaller. Okay. So the counterpart is now, okay, before we were just looking at these embedded expressions. So we had to distinguish conceptually between expressions and statements. So now we look at the statements, assignment, um, sequential composition of statements, and repetition. Okay. So S, M, down arrow, M prime. What does this mean? And what does a statement do in general? What does an assignment statement do? It typically changes the value stored in a variable. And assuming that we just have global memory so that that variable would be kind of an index into this, you know, like a, a symbolic index into this um, Big, big global structure that is our memory. And the point of a statement is basically the effect it has on the memory. So you look at the memory before, then you execute the statement, and then you look at what could have changed. So you can do a little side-by-side -side comparison. And the one thing that, or the, the set of changes, that is the side effect of the statement. So it's a different approach from uh, an expression language where we say, well, here's an expression. You know, what value is the meaning of this expression? And our interpreter tells us the meaning operationally, right? So here, the, op the effect is basically how the execution of the statements affects what is stored in memory. So we're interested in a statement for its side effect, right? So assignment, otherwise, you know, it, do, it doesn't necessarily, you know, depending on how your language is defined for the convenience of the programmer, you know, but assignment, the main point of assignment is to change memory, not so much to return a value, um, but there are language designs where those two um, things are, are merged. Anyway, so again, reading this from right to left, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at what an assignment statement does. Okay, so the assignment, if you're executing assignment of E to X in memory M, okay, then you're getting M prime. Uh, which is defined how? Well, if if E evaluates to R in M, and E might need M because E might have some variables embedded it, in it that it needs to look up in M, right? And here, similarly, you know, the the counterpart to running into a free variable in evaluating a lambda expression. What's the counterpart in this uh, simple imperative language? It's actually on the previous slide. And it's actually, you could say, well, it's, it's there by not being uh, listed explicitly, meaning if you're looking at something and you don't find a rule that applies, it's an error. So what is the counterpart to, uh, to running into a, a free unbound variable in a lambda expression? What's the counterpart here? The, the hint is to look, you know, to look only at rule one. You, there is no else part, right? Exactly. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Yeah, because there's no else. This doesn't happen. That's right. Yeah. 
And when does this not happen? Okay. So you're looking up the variable in memory, right? Yeah, when, when, when the memory does not match the expected result, the value of it. So what were you going to say? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so if you're trying to look up x, and you're not finding anything, that's right. So when there's no entry in the memory, right? Memory is like a little map of variables to uh, locations, right? That's right. So if you're not seeing anything for x, you know, then you don't find you don't find a v that you can look inside, right? So in that case, um, it's an undefined variable. And, you know, this is the kind of error you could have, for example, in dynamic languages like Python or so, you know, if you're just referring to a variable and you're not seeing it, you know, that's basically the else part here. That's right. Does that make sense? So there is that kind of counterpart, uh, but it's, it's um, understood in terms of, you know, what's defined in, in your global memory. Um, okay. So... Coming back here, all right, so let's say if E evaluates to R in M, and uh, because E is an expression, it doesn't actually modify M. But let's say if E evaluates to R, then assigning E to X in M will, will result in M prime as what's now in memory after the assignment, where M prime is like M, but it has the new value for X. Does that make, make sense? So we're just basically replacing whatever was the value of, of the location associated with X, we're replacing that value with R unconditionally. So we're, we're just expressing what happens when we assign something to a variable. So in other words, we don't care what was in there before, but after the assignment, the new value that's at the variable X in memory is the result of evaluating the expression. So it's very intuitive, but we're just expressing this intuition that we already have more precisely. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like memory management in these dynamic languages, is it like, is, is it handled by the compiler or by the language? Or because like in a language like, like C, you can assume that at, at any time you can get some value in the memory for either if it's something that you would expect, or, or even a garbage value, you, you, you can continue to, to, to execution. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good that's point, right. You're, you're right, so one could actually, one could say, well, um, now one could drill into this and look at the design space, so we're going to look at this in a second and then kind of uh, recap this point. So, you could say that strongly typed dynamic languages, which do runtime type checks and, and these kinds of checks properly, they will say, well, if there isn't an else branch, it's an error. You know, if, let's say if, 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 or let's say if we are going into this implicit else branch because we cannot find the variable, that's an error, right? So in Python, it will say that variable is undefined, okay? Whereas, as you said, in, in a language that is uh, weakly typed in that sense, or has weaker checks, it might be more permissive. It might say, uh, well, X is really a symbolic representation of, of some address, and we just go into that address even though nothing was really assigned to that place before, and we just grab whatever happens to be there and, and continue, right? So that's right. So it, it maps back to how you're dealing with, uh, you know, how, how you're, in, how you're uh, defining your semantics, uh, whether it's in a stricter or more permissive way. Now, you mentioned memory management, uh, you know, which is actually a more, more advanced topic. Here we're, we're just assuming um, basically a single global address space where we're storing values. 
Um, so this is a very, very basic way just for us to to understand um, these operational semantics for a very simple language. Um, memory management is a much more advanced topic where it's really about um, dealing with the fact that um, programs might allocate memory, then uh, you know, place structures in those locations, use them for a while, then not need them anymore, and um, how do we make sure that that memory doesn't continue being taken up? You know, how do we, how how does that memory get freed up so that the program can use it later? Because Otherwise, um, the program might run out of memory. Let's say if you have a loop that repeats many times, and every time you repeat the loop, you need some kind of object, work with it, and then you don't need it anymore. Unless you properly manage and return that object to memory, you have what's called a memory leak, and if it's in a loop, you will run out of memory pretty quickly. Right? So that's more what you know, memory management is about. And you have the design space consisting of um, automatic memory management, which is what we're used to, you know, with garbage collection being the common way to describe this. Um, and then we heard about some other thing in the Objective C talk, right? Uh, called reference counting. That you mentioned that that they had that for a while. So that's. Um, Another approach, other than garbage collection, to uh, automatic memory management. And then you have what you have in C or C++, which came out in your talk, uh, where at least in previous versions of C++, the, the programmer is responsible for allocating memory, using it, and then deallocating it when they no longer need it. In the case of uh, explicitly allocated memory, you know, as opposed to Local variables that are that live on the stack. So when you invoke a method, those get created, and then when you return from the method, those go away automatically. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So this is basically what you know. The, the way we're defining assignment is in terms of the effect on memory, the before and after. Okay. Meaning afterwards. There's a mapping for x with value r associated with x, just like you would expect, right? So the only one thing that you should expect for sure after an assignment is that now you will find the assigned value at that variable in memory, right? That's all we say here, nothing else. Any questions? And the rest, you know, it's very simple. We say, well, sequence of statement S1 followed by S2 is just the sequence of those effects. Meaning, you know, if S1 goes from M to M prime, and S2 goes from M prime to M double prime, then doing S1 followed by S2 is like going from M to M double prime. You know, it's very reasonable, right? And then while loop has these two cases having to do with the value of the loop condition, which gets evaluated every time. So it simply says, while loop, if the condition is false, it has no effect, right? It means it's an empty statement. And if the condition is true, then we execute the loop body once, right? Meaning we, we um, get from M to M prime because of S. And then, you know, we execute the while loop in M prime and get M double prime, okay? And that means doing the while loop itself, the original loop in M, we go to M double prime, okay? Does that make sense? So it simply describes what we already know about a while loop, it just describes it more formally, and it means, right, um, the while loop is defined in terms of executing the body and then 
repeating. And every time we execute the body, there is an effect which is um, going from M to M prime. And ideally, for this Y loop to terminate, it would be a kind of change that would ultimately lead to this case here, right? To the terminating case, where E, in that memory that we're looking at, um, will evaluate to zero representing false. Does that make sense? So we're just we're just defining a while loop in in terms of if. And you see how that's basically the same as as recursion. In, ca in fact, this definition is recursive. So it defines repetition in terms of recursion, which is interesting. This normally we say, oh, there's recursion that's understand it in, time, in terms of repetition, and this does this. the opposite. Right? But the key is understanding that we're interested in statements for the effect they have on memory, the so-called side effect. And we're defining statements in terms of their effect. And at the heart of it, there's, of course, assignment. And everything else is easily built on top of our understanding of assignment. But assignment is the, the centerpiece here. Just like in the lambda calculus, the centerpiece is which construct? Lambda, in a way, sets things up so that you can have this, that you can do the centerpiece. Application. Application, that's right. Application, you know, that makes something happen. The, the, the reduction is defined in terms of the substitution. And here, assignment is what, you know, our, our most basic building block for effects. And if we want to have multiple effects, well, we can compose them sequentially. If we want to have something where we don't have to write multiple steps and uh, there's some kind of commonality so we can express it as repetition, we can do that. That's what the loop is for. But uh, kind of the basic building block is assignment and the basic building block for making something interesting happen in the lambda calculus is application. Excellent. So. Um, Let's see. So I think there's a, probably a piece of code for this somewhere in Bitbucket. But I think it's in here. But I'll just give you an idea. No, nah, it's somewhere else. Let's see. Oh, F sharp, these things? Um, at some level, yes, because it has mutable variables. Right? So, but it also has function closures. You know, so, this is really, these, these examples are, or these, these example languages, like our simplified lambda calculus and this simple imperative language are, are deliberately kept so simple that we can learn the techniques by looking at them. But in a real language, it's going to be much more complex, you know, maybe with multiple paradigms being supported. Because actually, less, uh, it's very, very much actually limit, limited to, to what we are learning in our language, right? Because this, this syntax is so simple. Right, the syntax is simple, but at least does everything by you know using libraries, meaning uh, sets of function definitions, and um, Lisp actually does have mutable state. You know that's the thing. So the lambda calculus we're looking at uh, is is simpler in that respect, whereas Lisp has mutable variables, whereas Haskell doesn't. So what we have is really the underlying. It's like an untyped stripped down version of Haskell, whereas Lisp is um, kind of a hybrid. You know, it, it really has this also, so it's more complex even just a very simple uh, 
uh, lisp. But still, I mean, as George was saying on the uh, discussion forum, the uh, actual code for the, the original lisp interpreter is, is very small, and you can kind of make sense of it by looking at it. But you will see elements of this kind of stuff. But again, this is this is the kind of um, you know, reduction semantics, operational semantics. Um, so you would still have to translate this to an, an actual implementation, and that's what happens when you kind of read it backwards and you translate it into uh, you know, a recursive interpreter that says, okay, if I'm looking at this, you know, how is it defined? Well, by doing this and then recursively doing that, you know, for example. So you, you, you implement it like you're reading it backwards. And I was going to look at the code just so you can see that it's really simple. So let me try that. Um, Oh, I think I know where it is now. So, but what the, what's going on here? Why did it bump me out of there? Okay, anyway, doesn't matter. It's going to be, I think, here because I ported everything from my old um, GitHub repository. Here. here. Should be here. In misc dash scala. So let's take a quick look. Imperative. Yes. Okay. So there is abstract syntax, you know, very similar. Variable, sequence, while, and assignment. Okay. So the Equivalent to what we did for the lambda calculus, it's here. And then these things are defined. There's really only one uh, recursive type, and this is not doing F algebras or functors. So this is before I understood how to do that. Um, so it's just a plain old recursive tree type. And here it says, so sequence is zero or more statements. Variable is like this. The arithmetic stuff is there. Assignment has a statement on the left and a statement on the right. And if on the left, that's a concern that we're not addressing syntactically, but if on the left we're not finding a variable or if it doesn't evaluate to a variable, then it's an error. But we don't necessarily worry about it syntactically. So that's why we say, well, these things are just trees. So assignment has to have uh, a statement on the left and a statement on the right. Okay, and now the interpreter is here, the execute. And you will see that there's not that much to it, right? So this cell is just a, a kind of wrapper to a variable, and it's also the, it could be a register that I can assign to, or it could be a memory location. So it's, it's similar to stuff you see in actual hardware in that respect. And here it says assignment, and store is that global, the memory M. So that store thing, that is your M. And what this does is the arithmetic ones are easy. So you just look up the, um, I mean, you just, you just, recursively evaluate the arithmetic expression, and then you put the actual numeric operator uh, to combine the partial results. So variable is this thing here. So variable means we're looking up the read, write, or modifiable memory location that's associated with a variable. So this is specifically not yet the value does that make sense? Because if this variable occurs on the left, we don't want the value. We want the actual memory location. Does that make sense? That's a key point here. So that's why we're only going until the memory location. 
And that's why everything is stored in a cell. So in other words, this is a, a cell or memory location, as, as these things are called here. Storage cell, right? That's why I'm using that terminology. So when you're evaluating a variable, you're getting, you know, you're hoping to get the memory location associated with this variable in our global memory store. Okay? And now, um, when you're evaluating assignment, you say, well, let's evaluate the expression on the right, and we get that in a storage cell, but that could be conceptually something that's like a, a register, right? When we evaluate stuff in hardware, it gets stored somewhere. I mean, you don't just have the value, you know, it has to be stored somewhere. And that's um, what we get here, okay? And then what is on the left, what do we want it to evaluate to? Well, unless it evaluates to something we can assign to, the program wouldn't make much sense, right? It would be an error. Or we wouldn't see the effect of the assignment beyond the assignment statement. You know, that's a more permissive way to look at it. But anyway, so we have a storage location containing or representing what we have on the left, and we have a storage location containing whatever value we got on the right. And then we take that value from the right and set or stick it into the storage location on the left. That is the implementation of assignment here. Okay. And then the other stuff is straightforward. I mean, you know, statement obviously you just execute the statement sequentially using fold left or something like that. And then while, there's a reason we're mapping while to while in our implementation language. Um, the reason is we don't want a stack overflow in our interpreter when the um, program we're interpreting is a perfectly good constant space loop, right? Because if that were if that were recursion, right, and we had a a while loop in the program we're interpreting and we had many, 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 many iterations, then we might get a stack overflow because of the recursion. Okay. Although the recursion would probably be uh, tail recursive anyway, but you know we're not relying on that here. Anyway, so what do we do in the while loop? Well, we evaluate the condition or guard. If that's non-zero, meaning non-false, we evaluate the body for its effect on the memory. And then we reevaluate the guard and repeat the process. So we're we're interpreting a while loop um, recursively, or here as a transformation of the recursive implementation to a, an iterative one. So that's really all there is to it, right? And the store is actually defined up there. Store is just a mapping of strings to something called L value and it can contain ints. And the L value is just, that stuff is up here and it's also extremely simple. So an R value is something that can give you a value. And an L value is something that can give you a value but you can also put a value in it. So an L value is a modifiable storage location. And a cell is an I uh, implementation of L value, that's all. Right, so cell, you know, conceptually this could be like a, a register in your processor or it could be a memory location. Same, abstractly it's the same idea. 
they, you know, they both support looking up the value or modifying the value. So based on these simple abstractions, um, you can define this little interpreter. Okay, so this implements the behavior described on those on those slides with the blue background. Does that make sense? So now you've basically seen. I'll I'll uh, update the Trello card with the links to these things um, tomorrow morning or so. So I wanted to show you this so that you would see the purely functional side of things and the very simple imperative side of things. And then there are more examples that um, show you how to expand this further with mutable objects, things like that. Yes? Is one of the, dif is one of the differences compared to the functional stuff, like function application is kind of like going from successive function applications would be going like M to M prime, M double prime kind of thing? Yeah, very similar to that, exactly, because you basically have those lambdas that are kind of like a, an entry in memory, like a, a mapping in memory from a variable to a value. And every time you're, you're applying, you're doing something similar to assigning a value to that variable that the lambda introduces. So that's right. With, you know, with the subtle difference that um, in our version of the lambda calculus, we're doing what's called normal order evaluation, meaning we're substituting the unevaluated actual argument expression. And that means that, um, you know, so that's equivalent to on-demand evaluation, um, which changes uh, certain you know, termination properties, meaning that um, if the argument doesn't get, you know, if there's an error in the actual argument or the actual argument doesn't terminate, like it gets stuck in some kind of infinite recursion or so, um, it gets passed in and if there is, let's say, a branch or for whatever reason that expression never gets evaluated, then it doesn't do any harm, right? Whereas you could have a strict so-called applicative order lambda calculus also where you always evaluate the argument before passing it in. So, you know, there's a trade-off, right? The normal order has these nice properties that um, programs that so certain programs can terminate that wouldn't otherwise terminate, but uh, the strict calculus has, um, in many way, in many cases, better efficiency. You know, because you evaluate, let's say, if that argument x, the formal argument x, appears in multiple cases, in multiple places in the body, you would have to evaluate it again every time, right? And in the strict calculus, you evaluate it once, pass it in, and, and you have it. Okay, but that's why there's a lot of work, uh, of course, on things like common sub-expression elimination, again, for um, normal order as well. You know, the Haskell community has done a lot of work on, on optimizing um, the evaluation of that type of code. Excellent. Other questions, comments? Okay, so that's cool. Um, let's see now. Uh, yeah, so we were looking at this part here. Basically what, well, let's tie it together by looking at this. So um, we, we saw now operational semantics for uh, purely functional language, which is our project 3A, and we saw operational semantics and, and their implementation for uh, simple imperative language. Okay. And then um, there is another type of uh, uh, dynamic, um, dynamic semantics, which is axiomatic, which um, expresses the semantics in, in the form of some rules. And 
Let me fix this link. Uh, I see why is there. Why are there two sets of parentheses here? I guess that would explain the problem. Much better. Okay. All right. So basically, you know, logical axioms. It's not as commonly used as um, operational semantics usually. And um, so static semantics, as we said, deals with typing. And I wanted to look a little bit at the design space for that. And um, so a type system is defined here. right? And a type error is a type-related error in the behavior. And type safety is uh, when a type system is used to prevent type errors. OK. So for example, try to add things that don't really support addition, OK? Or trying to index into something that's not really an array. As uh, you were saying earlier, so in C, you can maybe do a few of those things and get away with them. And then you uh, need to evaluate you know, or th th this trade-off, whether that's a good thing for a language to work like that or, or not so good. Because ultimately, you want the um, program to behave in such a way that you can rely on the results it produces. So it's usually better to know that something went wrong than to get a result that you cannot trust. You know, and that's really what type safety is about. So this is the design space, these dimensions. Okay, So static versus dynamic, meaning does the compiler look at the um, typing? issues, does the compiler enforce the type system, or does it happen at runtime? Are all the checks runtime type checks? There are some runtime type checks in our little interpreter. Can someone name such a thing in our little lambda calculus interpreter? What runtime type check is there? That one, you know, in fact, I would associate more with this kind of flow analysis. It's kind of more like that, but it happens at runtime, like an unbound variable. So that's kind of orthogonal to uh, the question of, you know, what type does that variable have? That's how I would interpret it. Any other thoughts? Right, so the, the first, the first uh, subtree, right, of, of application, that's right. Unless that's a function, you have a problem. So that, that's really a, t a type error. That's right. So there's a dynamic type check. You do application. You look at, you know, structurally, what do I get when I evaluate E1 in the app? And if E1 is anything other than a function, it doesn't have the right type to apply to some other expression. Exactly. So there's that type check in there. And that's a dynamic type check. And then strong versus weak is the dimension you know, where C represents the weak side and, let's say, Python, the strong side. So in Python, um, there are strong type checks, but they happen at runtime. So Python would be, would be dynamic, but strongly typed. C would do its type checks. The, the, various type checks it does do, it does them at compile time, but it, it enforces things weakly. So C is static yet weak. And then most statically typed languages are statically and strongly typed. Okay. And then there's the third dimension, so implicit versus explicit. And you've seen in Scala that uh, unlike Java, Scala uh, supports a lot more implicit typing. So you just have to type um, the arguments of methods, of, of non-anonymous methods, 
And normally it can infer the return type, and it can infer a lot of stuff, right? Whereas um, in explicit typing, you have to specify the types for a lot of stuff, like variables and so on. So those are the dimensions of the design space. And, you know, there's this trade-off. So this is the kind of thing that is, among other things, discussed in the, in the Uncle Bob um, interview, you know, among a number of other things. So just want to make sure where to where to finish here. Let me, let me get an overview again. Um, yep. So the benefits is uh, are that you know. So these are two, but then the third one just emerged. Um, and um, we'll get to that. So when you have static typing, you find out ahead of time whether something, for example, doesn't fit together. Like you're trying to apply something to an argument, but it doesn't really work with that type of argument and so on. So you get early error detection. And the other benefit is, this is also uh, significant, so um, if you do all the type checking at compile time and your type system is designed in such a way that when the static compile time type checking succeeds, no more type checking has to happen at runtime. Okay? What does that mean? It means I don't have to do any type checks at runtime. If I don't have to do any type checks at runtime, I don't have to keep any type information with me at runtime. So I don't have to do any of that stuff. So the code, the generated code is leaner and also faster because I don't need to do any of those checks. There might be other checks I need to do for pattern matching or so, but that, you know, that's different. It's somewhat different, right? So, so there's that performance benefit. And then, um, well, the, the third benefit is kind of a consequence of the first one. And so there's this research that claims that um, static typing makes you more productive, especially on larger projects. But, the, you know, the Agile community, I mean, not everybody in the Agile community, but let's say the, the Clojure and Ruby fans, you know, they... Uh, don't agree with that generally, but um, no. So it's it's an ongoing research effort. But um, let's see. So I posted something to the Facebook group to the uh, Chariot Systems uh, Tech uh, Techcast, and there's one where they're talking about what uh, you know. How do you how do you find out whether your language has good syntax? And, and during that interview, the um, interviewee mentions casually that there's evidence that static typing uh, results in higher productivity. Okay, so I'll add a few links because I started tracing that, those a little bit and I'm gonna add those um, as well to the, to the group. But the thing is, so when you, when you do, for example, Java, and when you're, let's say, instantiating an array list of string, for example, and it feels a little bit like a straitjacket, right? You have to say uh, array or list of int as the uh, variable type, and then you have to kind of repeat that when you're instantiating the object, etc. So, you know, that's kind of the challenge. How do you have? How, do, how can you have a type system without it? feeling very um, burdensome and restrictive. And um, so this is the, the stuff that Uncle Bob discusses. Um, so these three phases, so to speak, in, the, in this type system language pendulum. So the first phase is where the emphasis was on um, type safety and performance. And um, the, there, w there was also an increasing focus culturally on frameworks and libraries instead of languages. So there was a period when everybody was doing, let's say, language J, meaning, for example, Java, right? 
and say, oh, language doesn't matter, really. You know, what matters is you, know, you have the right libraries and frameworks and so on. And um, it's kind of a language monoculture trap. And then the pendulum started swinging in the opposite way. So th the dynamic languages um, gained in popularity, a lot of them have been around for a long time, like Perl, right? But they gained in popularity as a reaction to the, this earlier stage. So you wanted um, more productivity, um, at least perceived productivity. You wanted more expressiveness, flexibility, and so on. And the idea was, as I mentioned earlier, well, if you um, are very thorough in your testing, you can kind of um, build confidence in your code without having static typing. And then what about performance? So I'm, I don't remember if I, if I ever showed the shootout, you know, but if you go to the shootout, the so-called computer language benchmarks game, and you look at the relative performance of these language implementations. So you can look at the details. I'm just going to show you something really quickly. Now, where is... Um, there should be a link. Oh, here, which yeah, the one that I've used in the past. That's the one. Okay. And um, so we have. Yeah. So these are. This is what we want to look at. So these are the bare, these are um, some widely used, relatively widely used languages. Um, so this includes the Go language also. It's interesting. And the, it's like an index. So one is doing it in C. So bare metal doing it in the C language. And then every column here shows you logarithmically how much, by, by what factor it's slower than the C implementation. So, so this is, of course, you know, imp this is for a suite of examples. Um, it's a kind of average over a suite of examples. You can look at the details here. But it basically shows you, and it's, of course, for specific implementations of the languages available on Linux, and that might have, you know, a, an effect on the performance of, let's say, F sharp or C sharp and those kinds of things here, right? Uh, so what it shows you, so G++ is only very slightly slower. So is ADA. And it's unsurprising because they use the same tool chain I mentioned earlier, which is the, the new CC compiler suite. So these are just different front ends, but the languages are more complex, so there's actually different code generated in the back end. So here, GCC, that's where it's one, that bold line. Fortran also, uh, well, I guess that's an Intel Fortran for Linux. And then these are all unmanaged code, right? So where you generate machine code that runs on the hardware. And then these things, you know, so you see how Scala is, so that, you know, that jump is because you're going from unmanaged code to managed code. So that's a trade-off that has its benefits. What's, what's a key benefit of managed code? What can happen when you run unmanaged code that cannot normally happen when you run managed code? The, so called, you know, it used to be called, you know, maybe not anymore, the blue screen of death, right? <laughs> so that should not happen with managed code, but, you know, it, it means when your application crashes, it might take the machine down, the operating system with it. So with managed code, you have that layer, right, the VM, and the VM crashes maybe, so it's okay, right? That, that still isolates the machine from, from crashing. So, you know, that's a relatively small performance price here. Um, and 
between Scala and Java, there isn't really much. And even OCaml, which is the language F# -sharp is based on, to a large extent, right? So that's similar. And then Go is also quite good. Although Go, I think, is um, natively compiled. And then here's Lisp. And then what do you see here, the ones that are like way slower? What languages are those? Those are all these dynamic languages, right. So then the question, so you see here, I mean, it's kind of light gray, but you know, PHP, Perl, Python, and then there's one called Hack, I, I'm not really familiar with, and then Ruby and JRuby. And um, you know, so why would you use those? Well, there are reasons to use them, um, but you have to use them right meaning you don't want to write code that's your performance bottleneck in those languages. So as long as you use the, those dynamic languages to um, maybe tie together, you know, that's why they're also used, called glue languages, so by gluing together different invocations of very fast library code that's typically written in C, just to kind of transform arguments or pass them around and then let let the heavy lifting happen in the C code, you know, then effectively you're not suffering. You're not going to suffer from the negative uh, effects of, of the performance of those languages, you know, as long as that code is not in the critical performance path, right? So that's basically... You know, the, the, the argument here. All right, so that's the shootout, and we want to go back here. So that's summarized here. You know, and then since the late 2000s, languages primarily like F# -sharp, Haskell, and Scala, and also OCaml, have bounced back. Um, or F sharp is relatively new, of course, because they offer kind of uh, a combination you know, of the expressiveness and flexibility that you'd be used to from dynamic languages, but they give you this, the type safety and performance, okay? And then because of their functional paradigm emphasis, they um, promise better support for multi-core hardware, you know, where you can write things in, in immutable ways so you can map things e more easily to um, separate cores without them stepping on each other's toes in, by, by trying to modify this shared memory. Okay. So then, um, so here's this, this is an older radar, but, you know, you could basically see this. F sharp that's by now adopted, you know, Scala is adopted. Um, and this is where they said, well, future of Java, unclear, you know, but Java is probably going to experience a renaissance um, with these new features. And that's that other, uh, the dev news from uh, Chariot Solutions, where they summarize in this little audio podcast the key features. And it sounds like it's going to be a lot more like uh, Scala than in the past. So, meaning in a way that um, some of these features, and the same is happening in, in C++, right? So there's, um, can you confirm this? So there are going to be lambda expressions in, yeah. in C++, right? So it means that these more mainstream languages are um, starting to incorporate features that were more limited to more exotic languages, so to speak. What is that JavaScript and Oh, uh, <coughs> no JS and stuff like that. I, yeah, meaning that they're really taking JavaScript seriously as a as a language at some level. Although they're also saying not too long after this one. So this is, I think, two years ago. They were starting to say, well you shouldn't necessarily write your JavaScript in JavaScript. So what does this mean? It me really means you should use languages such as CoffeeScript or others that can be compiled to Java, you know, but are nicer, simpler languages. And then J JavaScript becomes really more uh, 
of, a, of a compilation target that can be executed efficiently uh, in something like Node.js uh, Node or using this uh, V8 uh, JavaScript interpreter. And in many cases, you know, the JavaScript that's generated like this is not meant to be read by a human. So it might be in some kind of single assignment style, you know, like linear uh, statements that really don't have a lot of object-oriented structure anymore. So it's really, it's mostly about that, I mean, evolving from, from this one here. And here's the functional Java library. So they were, they were looking at that. All right, so these are the main contenders. You know, so now I have to correct this. So Scala and Haskell have the support for these higher kinded types that allow us to do things like functors, monoids, et cetera. But all of these have concurrency support, et cetera. And then these are some interesting dynamically typed contenders, right? Um, closure, you know, is getting quite a lot of attention. Also here in the Chicago area, I think there's an active community. And there's also uh, an Erlang community here. So there are meetups for, for these that are quite active. And then, well, there are these examples that you can, you can look at uh, at your convenience. So, so basically, just I'll, I'll go through this quickly, and then we'll wrap up and head over there. Um, so the process tree, the idea is to transform this linear list where you have the process number and the parent process number into a tree form meaning it's basically an edge reversal, right? So here, this is a child to parent edge, and we want to have a parent to child edge. And then we represent that, and that, that allows us to represent it as a tree, right? So we have two occurrences of this PID, and that's the parent of this guy here, right? And the guy at the top. And then that one has more children. It's basically an edge reversal, so um, and then representing that uh, result of the edge reversal as a tree. And this is what it looks like in Java, right? So you have all this type information here explicitly, even in the uh, type of the object you're creating, and you have to repeat it on the left side uh, as the type of the variable. Um, so basically, also re requiring a name for every type, such as um, you know, if you want to have something like a pair or so, you have to give it a name so you can use it. Okay, so what does this look like in a dynamic in a dynamic language? See, so just strip out all the type information. It's pseudocode, of course, you know, but if it were written in, let's say, Python, it would look similar to this. So really, the only difference between this and that is getting rid of the type information. I mean, that's for the effect here, of course. So then, you know, in F sharp, you can do it using .NET collections. The algorithm is the same every time, right? So you just kind of store the stuff in a map and then reverse the map, okay? And then. When you do it in more functional style in F sharp, it looks like this. You know, kind of the style we're we're used to. And then there's a little bit of a performance overhead, but it's mostly because the tree-based maps have log performance, and the hash-based ones in .NET. Um, you know, so this is also consistent with what uh, you were saying in your presentation. You know, so the stuff, the performance close to C sharp, right? So especially if you're using .NET collections. Um, and then in Scala, it looks similar to this. Haskell also similar. And um, yeah, so basically that is then another question, so we'll probably address this down the road. Um, did I know? Here, I want to go here. Um, yeah, so we need to talk briefly about 3B. 
And we'll postpone these topics uh, until next time, so that's fine. So maybe read ahead a little bit. And um, project 3B, so I know some people are still wrapping up uh, 3A, you know, so do that. And um, then you will notice that 3B is actually a very small extension to 3A. You know, it's, it's not going to take you nearly as long as 3A. You know, even just wrapping your head around everything in in Project 3A, you know, and having the the this fairly complex substitution as an auxiliary function to evaluation, etc. So here, you know, you just add some branches for for these three extra constructs, really. Um, so any questions about 3B that you'd like me to address here? The, the thing to keep in mind, you know, that I want to emphasize up front is um, these cells are what you call lazy, also in the sense that when you're looking at a cell, okay, you don't evaluate into the children of the cell. You just say, okay, that's my cell, fine. So I have unevaluated children as expressions, and that's fine. That's how Haskell works, for example, okay? So the stuff gets evaluated only when you really need it, when you access it. Um, so that's why here, for example, look at the first example. A cell with two arithmetic sub-expressions, it evaluates to itself. So that first line, okay? Whereas if you take the head of that, it takes, you know, it goes into that um, left child and evaluates it and you get a constant. And a tail does the same thing for the right child. And then if the cell appears, so cell or function or anything, it's like true. It's, it's not a false value. The only false value we have is const zero. Okay. And then, so what um, other thing does const zero also represent that is common, let's say, in C or Java? Rather, actually the opposite, right? Because if it represents false, right? Oh, okay, in Unix, right, yeah, yeah, so for the command line utilities, that's true. That's, that, so no, the absence of an error code. But the way we're using it here, so in, in inside a C program, in the conditional, right, it represents false. Right, exactly. So it's like a null, like a null pointer, right? So meaning that if you try to, in, if you try to drill into a null, that's an error. So just like in Java, you know, if you try to um, invoke a method on a null, that's an error. It's a null pointer exception. So it's very similar to this kind of stuff here, okay? So if you're trying to use head or tail on anything other than a, an actual cell, you get an error. So, you know, this one is a, a type error in a way, and these things are errors like null pointer exceptions. And then that last example shows, okay, well, I can store functions in cells. So this really means I could build an object system using just this very simple construct that I'm adding, okay? So that, that's how they do it in, in Lisp. So the common Lisp object system, you know, it's, it's built from simpler Lisp constructs, and it follows, you know, because it's, it's uh, dynamically typed, so it relies on certain conventions that you have to follow. <coughs> 
so that it all fits together. Okay. Um, so then, you know, the these things are meant to be based on the Scala example. So you you take some of these corresponding Scala examples, um, similar to the examples we have in in recursion on lists, right? Um, following this hint. So um, implement those representing them using our calculus, and then applying the Y combinator to it, you should be able to compute the length. And the length is defined by just following the right child of each cell until you cannot go any further, right? And the size would be counting all the cells. So these will be interesting, but you know they're they're just like stuff you've already written, but you have to make it work, you know, represent it using the simple calculus. But you know, I'll I'll provide guidance, and I know that we're getting a lot of guidance from within the group, which is really wonderful. I think that's working really well, and um, we'll you know let's shoot for. What's today the ninth? You know, let's uh, let's do it like this. You know, so just try to um, try to wrap up Project Three A as as soon as you can, and then um, work on Three B, and it will probably not take you much longer than um, you know than getting Three A done. So, any questions, comments at this point, concerns? Okay, um, and then we have a little test scheduled for next week, and I will uh, shoot you a roadmap for that. Okay, so based mostly on the topics covered up up to today, up to and including today, and primarily Project 3A also. So you should be intimately familiar with Project 3A, so that will give you additional motivation to wrap it up right before. You really want to be done before the test. Okay. Great. So any comments? All right. So um, if you're available, I'll see you over there at the uh, ACM talk. Where exactly is it? Is it here? Let's double check. Let's double check. That's a good question. I think it's, yeah, Lewis Tower, 13th floor, so over there. Excellent.